Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So it's been a few days since I didn't upload, sorry for that. I have a very good excuse. My daughter, yes, I have a child, um, got chicken pox. So I've been looking after my daughter and been pretty much unable to do much else apart from random shit posting on Facebook. Um, but nevertheless, life continues. Various things have been uh, going on. So I thought I would just do a little bit of a quick update, but also show you some of the things that I will be talking about in future videos and new things that I've acquired. So first of all, anybody who follows the Facebook page, and if you don't, why don't you? Uh, link below. Uh, but anybody who follows, follows the Facebook page will have seen a couple of things uh, which I've recently acquired. I'll talk about one of those briefly. Um, I've kept it inside a, a plastic bag because I'm looking after it like it's a precious object because frankly it is um, but also because I've just been cleaning some swords um, in a rare moment of uh, not having to do parental duties so I've been quickly cleaning some swords and so my hands are a little bit grubby so I'll keep it in here to keep it safe um, but essentially it's Robbins's Cavalry Catechism and um, that is a real mouthful of a name and is it? essentially it's a cavalry manual it's the kind of thing that an officer joined the British cavalry in the mid 19th century. This dates to 1851. Actually, this copy is signed 1852. Um, and um, it's the kind of thing that an officer joining the uh, cavalry would buy as essentially a handbook to how to do everything. And it's really fascinating. It's got things in it ranging from obviously cavalry formations, how to scout through woods, how to defend streets on foot, how to man artillery if you have to, even though you're cavalrymen, and, but anyway, if you've taken over some enemy guns, and that's relevant, and I'll come back to that in a second. But what makes this really important as a book and why I bought it, you can incidentally see a scanned version of this manual on Google Books, um, and I put a link to that on the Facebook page. But this particular copy was owned by a very uh, particular individual called Alfred Stowell Jones of the 9th Lancers. And the reason that he is significant is he's a Victoria Cross winner. He won the Victoria Cross during the Indian Mutiny, uh, which as any of my regular viewers will know, I have a particular interest in, but I'm particularly interested in all of these wars uh, from the middle of the 19th century, from the, most of the 1840s through to the 1860s. And uh, this particular copy that I've got here is actually, uh, it's got his name and date and regiment on two different pages written in his own hand, Alfred Stowell Jones of the Ninth Lancers. And um, it's dated 1852, and the mutiny was in 1857 to 58, um, and he won the Victoria Cross. And what he essentially did was he led a uh, cavalry force uh, through some enemy that they cut down. They took some um, enemy guns, they captured enemy guns, and they then manned the enemy guns and turned the guns on the enemy. Um, and they won, he won the Victoria Cross for leading this action. And uh, what's interesting is this very book, this very manual that he had purchased five years earlier, actually contains instructions for manning artillery, even though he was a cavalry officer. So the fascinating link up there. And you know, it's very uh, desirable and difficult, frankly, to find things which belongs to a Victoria Cross winner, because the Victoria Cross being the most prestigious military award probably in the world, but certainly in the British Army and in British history, is anything's highly desirable which is connected to a VC winner. So I grabbed it and uh, thank you very much uh, to my um, Eastern Antique Arms customer and uh, viewer who pointed this out to me and pointed me to it. It's uh, much appreciated. Um, and also I posted something else uh, when I posted this on the Facebook page. Um, I've got a pile of swords here, so I'm just filtering through them. And it is this whopping great sabre. Now most of you will recognise the hilt as fundamentally quite like a 1796, in fact it is a 1796 light cavalry officers, in this case hilt. However, it is mounted on an absolute freaking beast of a blade. Um, and this is a really massive, beefy blade. But, um, and it, I've got to say, so as I've mentioned on the Facebook page, it, it is not a pleasant sword to wave around, um, unless you particularly like waving around baseball bats, for example. It is like a shape, sharpened baseball bat. The point of balance is like 12 inches from the grip. 
It is absolutely way up there. And you might think, well, that's a, that's a piece of crap. Why do you like it so much? Well, because there's something very special about this blade. It is, I believe, Woots. And in fact, I would go further than believe. Uh, it, I, I am 97% certain that this is a solid, massive lump of Woots. Now, Woots, as many of you will know, is the is the crucible steel that was produced in India and some parts of the Middle East, perhaps near Damascus, perhaps related to to the name Damascus steel. We don't really know. That's a contentious issue because that could be as I mentioned in a previous video, that could come from Damask, the pattern, and therefore might be applicable to pattern welding as well as woots. But whatever, woots steel. It was highly sought after and highly prized. And it was a particular type of crucible steel. Now, what's a crucible steel? It means it's cast steel, it's been melted. And how that's different to all other steels that went before that, and even at the same period, is most other steels were made through the bloomery process and contained a lot of impurities, commonly known as slag. Um, cast steel basically melted the steel, all of the impurities went to the top, were skimmed off, and then that steel was slowly cooled down, and you had a more pure iron, which you could then introduce carbon into and make something more similar actually to a modern steel. Modern steels are like that, they are more pure. But the thing that's particular about Woots is its pattern on its surface. Now, this has patina, that is oxidization on the surface, but I can nevertheless, right in front of my eyes, you won't be able to see it unfortunately on the camera, see swirling patterns right the way along here. I can't see it on the whole blade, I can't see any here for example, but I can see swirling patterns all around there and equally all around here and up to about there and a little bit again up here. So this blade is a massive lump and it is a really colossal lump of Woots steel. And my hypothesis is that it was taken from a tulwa or perhaps a polwa, and then there's been a scarf weld to apply a new tang to it, and it's then had a 1796 hilt mounted on it. So therefore, my theory would be that a British officer probably serving in India at the time, maybe around, the, around 1800 to 1820, which is when this style of hilt would have been um, in vogue and regulation, essentially wanted a, a, a Woots blade because they had heard that Woots was, was the bomb and was really what, you know, was what the, the serious people had. And um, uh, so they probably went out and procured the biggest lump of, uh, <laughs> the biggest bladed tulwa that they could find um, and um, had it mounted, had a new tang welded on it because Remember tulwars, just grab a tulwar off the wall here, have a partial tang. They don't usually or don't always have a full tang. And the tang often goes only up to about there in the hilt. And it is glued in, that is right, it is glued in with resin. Um, obviously if someone is from a European sword background, they want a tang which goes all the way through and is peened or riveted at the end there. So they have very clearly had a new tang welded um, to the base of the blade that would go the full length. Um, and the, there are possibly other advantages to welding a separate tang to a blade. I've spoken about separate tangs in the past. One of the advantages is that it means you can have a soft iron tang with a harder steel blade, which means that your tang is less likely to break. It might bend, it might, it might stretch, but it's not gonna snap. And that means that your hilt stays firmly attached to your blade, which if you're fighting with it is obviously a good thing. If you have a higher, a harder but more brittle tang. If it breaks, it breaks and your hilt falls off and your blade goes flying away so you can't fight with the sword anymore. So that's one potential mechanical advantage. Anyway, this is possibly the largest lump of Woots I have, uh, certainly that I've ever owned, uh, and one of the largest lumps of Woots I have ever seen. It is a massively thick and heavy blade. It's not, uh, you know, unwieldable. I mean, I, I can still, I could still sort of fight with it, but I'd have to adapt how I normally use a sabre for the fact that this handles a bit like a baseball bat, you know, that point of balance alone. But you've got to bear in mind as well, this is a cavalry sword and probably optimized for use from horseback. So a lot of the time when you're fighting on horseback with a sword, you don't actually necessarily move the sword very much except in defense. Um, but when you're actually attacking, you don't necessarily swing the sword like you would on foot. You just ride your horse really quickly and hold the blade out. So having a heavier blade might be fine in, in that situation. Anyway, um, most importantly, 
I have um, procured some ferric um, ferric chloride, is that right? Um, today, which is a form of uh, etching, uh, etchant, is that a word? Um, but it's a thing that you use for etching circuit boards and things like that. And apparently, it should work on this. So I'm gonna have a go, I'm gonna clean up the blade, polish the blade a bit, and then I'm gonna have a go at bringing out that Woots pattern. Uh, assuming that it's there, but I feel I feel more than 90, I said 97, I think I'm closer to 99% certain because I can actually see the Woots pattern in the blade as I'm talking to you now. But hopefully when I polish it and then I do the etching material, that Woots pattern will come up even stronger. And what I'm gonna do, what I'm intending to do is film that process and of course photograph the results so you can see. So anyway, a very, very interesting sword which I'm looking forward to having a little project on. Right, a few things I procured recently, or rather relatively recently, which I intend to talk about in future videos. I'm just going to do a quick run through them because I realise I've been talking for quite a long time already, as usual with me. Firstly, this uh, Bavarian pattern welded Damascus, not Woots, pattern welded uh, Bavarian officer's sword. A bit of a mystery, I'm going to do a brief video, Matt Easton brief anyway, video about that, uh, which I have been requested to do. Um, another sword which I might talk about and that relates to two swords behind me on the wall is this 1827 pattern Royal Navy officer's sword and I just want you to note that very raised what's sometimes known as a quill um, edge or false edge um, or yelman um, indeed and almost certainly inspired by Turkish um, swords um, so we've got raised false edge there and then I just point you to I have been asked numerous times now to talk about this sword behind me on the wall. I will do that. Um, and notice the raised false edge there, much like this one. And then this sword above it, notice again, raised false edge there. So I'm gonna be talking about that in a future video. Um, and then the last sword I've got in this pile, I will be talking about this sword, which I have had fully restored. It came to me as with a scabbard that had decayed to nothing. Uh, except for some fittings um, and um, covered in rust and I have a good friend who is a fantastic in fact I, I can't say I can't understate how good a restorer he is he is the best restorer of swords and weapons that I know of in the world full stop he used to do work for Wilkinson Hawks a lot of these big companies that used to provide um, swords to officers and indeed he's restored uh, uh, swords that belong to the royal family. Anyway, he restored this sword for me and he has done an amazing job and this is an amazing sword so I will be talking about that. And the final object I acquired recently which I'm definitely going to be doing a video about um, but I just want to do a little bit more research on it before I make the video is this. What do you think this might be? <laughs> let's let's commit suicide with this right what is it that's right Whoa, it's a bit big for this room it is a practice bayonet okay it probably dates to about 1900 and I believe is the practice bayonet um, rifle for the long Lee Enfield I think, but I want to make certain of that. A lot of um, websites and a lot of antique dealers, whatever, will describe this as World War I, and indeed many of them date to World War I, but I believe that they were this particular design was originally made as a practice one for the long Lee Enfield, not the short magazine Lee Enfield. So um, the important thing to note about it, it is the weight and size of a real rifle. It is heavy. This is nothing like, if you've ever heard, held a practice bayonet waster, which is made of wood, this is a lot heavier than that, okay? This is the weight of a military magazine bolt action rifle. It is a heavy, great thing. Weighs about nine pounds. Uh, so it's, the, it's heavier than most pole axes are, okay? It's the weight of a very large pole arm. Um, so very heavy, but quite well balanced. It balances pretty much in the front support hand where you'd normally be shooting a rifle. Okay, um, it's got a large, it's got large weights. It's got a solid um, steel breech, so it's the weight of the real thing. It's you know it's got a great big uh, butt. Uh, it's got a massive butt, and as you guys know, I love a massive butt. And this one is a really firm butt as well, uh, made of uh, made of steel. Um, but the important thing is from 
I think it was 1863 onwards in the British Army, they started using practice bayonets with plungers. Okay, so this is like a pogo stick essentially. So inside here, and you can unscrew this, inside here is a large spring. Um, the original ones made in 1863 had India rubber in them, but they didn't work very well. So they, anyway, they put some spring in there. And the whole point is you can thrust people with this and not kill them, which is a really good thing if you're just training. Okay, and it has an end which was sometimes covered in gutter percha or rubber essentially, uh, but often not. And they wore similar stuff to what we wear for something like modern longsword HEMA. So big fencing helmets, as they called them, with a back and a side big padded jackets, big padded gloves, leg guards, all this groin guards, all this kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, and they used to have bayonet fencing competitions right the way up and well, obviously through World War One, bayonet was still big, uh, but it kind of died out between the wars, shall we say, after World War One. There was still, the Royal Marines still famously still had a bayonet fencing competition up until about the 1950s, I think. Um, so it was still continued in the British military and certainly in like the Russian military, it was still carried on until I think after the Second World War. Anyway, there we go. Um, this is a fantastic thing I will be talking. I, I just actually talked quite a lot about it just there, didn't I? That wasn't intentional, but I will talk more about it and bayonet fencing in general in a future video. See ya. Thanks for watching, please subscribe, we have extra videos on Patreon and you can follow us on Facebook.